Amen and amen. Oh, how I love you, Jesus.
someone say thank God it's not 2020 anymore. <laughs> Amen. And that means so many things to so many people. I saw an article this week it was reposted and I don't remember who reposted it but it was actually an article from Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs. I don't know if you saw it, but it was a magnificent approach. I never, I mean, obviously he's got this great, incredible radio, TV voice where he narrates uh, Deadliest Catch and other things that he's done, and you hear his voice occasionally on commercials, and even he does a commercial or two. But um, it was enlightening about him a little bit but the thing that struck me the most, he, he was fixing to appear on Hannity, and he had just heard somebody uh, speak disparagingly of some folks uh, in another interview before he was up, and he said it got him to thank him. He said, I had just watched It's a Wonderful Life for the 1,000th time plus, probably, and he said, I got to thinking about George Bailey, and that's going to come into play in th toward the end of the sermon as well. Uh, not a repeat of last year, by the way, but still, uh, it's that time of year, and it's good to think about that. I mean, everyone, we're experiencing a new year, and there's some things to think about. And as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper today, uh, which is, uh, according to the book of Luke, um, he, Jesus said, do this and remember me when you do it. And I got to thinking about remembering it, and back to Mike Rowe for a moment, he, he said there's some terminologies that have come into place uh, because of COVID and the things that took place in business losses and uh, we all have experienced that. I know I didn't tune the piano for four or five months and still it's a little sporadic and that kind of thing. But 
it, it's affected everybody. It's affected everybody in various ways. Many people are uh, are completely destitute because of it, because they've lost their jobs. It, so many things have happened. Business owners have lost businesses. Um, I don't think anybody's even put a good assessment on the cost. But he said there's a term, one of the things that's come in uh, because of that, and when the government started assessing who should be able to do what, and these people can do this, and these businesses are considered essential, like hospitals and doctor's offices, of course, and stuff like that. Well, in that process, some terminology came to... Uh, came into play and it was some people feeling like they are non-essential. We talk about a non-essential business, but think about the people in that business, the employees of that company. And the bottom line is they're not essential. And he said, you know, it's, it's caused some people to go suicidal and so on and so forth because they have lost all hope because they feel like nobody cares. That being the platform that we're going to jump off of into this morning's message, the thing that began to strike me through this week, and of course I did watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life again, and, and uh, I, I had already begun to research how I was going to maybe bring that into this morning's message, but the thing that stood out to me regarding us and our relationships to people and our relationship to Christ and what that means as we live our life out among other people I was reminded that Jesus talked about go the second mile. Somebody asked you to go a mile with them, go too. Well, if you ponder that for very long, that has a multiplicity of applications. In fact, when Jesus brought it up in Scripture, it wasn't the first thing he said about living in a manner that was beneficial to other people. Thinking of others, going the second mile, is a term that we like to use, but it has various meanings and various circumstances. But let's read it in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 5, starting with verse 38. It says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. <laughs> but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak too. And whoever compels you to go one mile with him, Go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust for if you love those who love you what reward have you do not even the tax collectors do the same and if you greet your brethren only what do you more than others do not even the tax collectors do so well we know that the Going the second mile concept came from a particular practice that was in play from the Roman government for soldiers who had heavy pieces of equipment and backpacks we would think of today maybe, probably a shoulder bag of some sort, and to carry their 
essentials and their armor as they were going about. Well, a soldier could meet you on the street or the road and say, I need you to carry my things for a mile. And you were required to do so. You were under penalty of law. You could actually be in prison if you did not comply. And Jesus is saying, when somebody compels you, which that was what that was, it, it, it can be in the form of a request and ask nicely, but it was still the law. But what else can we say about that? Do more than is expected of you. On more than one occasion, several of you have stepped up to the plate when you knew that Betty and I needed something and took care of it. Sometimes it was yard work, sometimes it was other things. Not expected, but you just stepped up to the plate and did it. I appreciate that. But that's a great example of what this whole idea is talking about. Going the second mile means thinking outside the box. Oh, by the way, did I tell you that there's not a box? We keep thinking certain ways and certain things we do and everything's categorized and this, that, and the other. But if you think about it, when it comes to Jesus, it's just a big picture. And circumstances of life come and they go and you respond how you would because of Jesus in your life to that circumstance. You know, we look at other people. We all do this. It can be bad, but it's not necessarily bad in and of itself. But when we look at someone, a lot of times we do it just by visually. Or maybe we hear them say something or they're being obnoxious in a restaurant or something and, you know, we make judgments. We look at people and we think, oh, that person's a, a cut above who I am. Or somebody will say something that's extraordinary and you think, well, I don't think like that. I think they're, they're a little maybe a step above me in the way they think. Or you might say, look at someone and say, oh, we're kind of on an equal scale. And you may look at someone else and say, man, and you're not saying this out loud and you're not being ugly and so on, but they, we do that. We put people in categories and we kind of base it around who we are. But what Jesus is trying to get across here is it's not about who you think you are. It's about what I want you to be and how I want you to respond to any given situation. Now, we're going to do that better, equal, and below thing because it's, we just do that. As long as we don't treat people in a fashion that's unbecoming of someone who knows Jesus Christ, then I think it's fine. So go beyond your duty. Don't think of any one person ever as non-essential. I love what some of you have said about the things you encounter when you do the meals for wheels or meals on wheels or I don't know how that is said. <laughs> meals on wheels, I think. And some of the people and you've expressed your concerns and things of that nature. And that's a great example of taking care of the Lord's business. But as we look at our lives, and I think you should go out of your way to tell people that they're special. Because God loves them no matter what. He's asked us to display that love to them. People need to be encouraged. They need a pat on the back. Some people need lots of care. Some people need lots of TLC. 
and they need a lot more than words. I love being a part of this congregation because you folks really do think of others. You go out of your way to give money to folks and things of that nature, and I, I'm just blessed to sit back and watch you do what you do so well. You're such a giving people. But I think a really good example of not being selfish with your life is George Bailey with It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, go ahead. Of course, Jenny Stewart was the star of the of picture. Go ahead to the next one. And there's the whole family. This happens more toward the end of the movie. But stay back there. And then, but when you look at the beginning of the movie, think about it for a moment. What do you see? You hear angels, and I guess a head angel, and a lesser angel, and a lesser, lesser angel having a conversation about George Bailey, who's down in the snow praying a prayer, and that's the way the movie begins, and they're figuring out how to help George Bailey overcome the circumstances that he finds himself in, which of course happens at the end of the movie, but then they tell the angel that's supposed to go down and help George Bailey, they're help telling him George's story so that he can have a perspective on how George deals with things and, and how to help him once he gets down there. Clarence, the angel that hadn't earned his wings yet. But the first encounter we find with George Bailey, no, that's it, is him riding down the snowbank into the area where there's a pond <laughs> on a shovel, and boy, the <coughs> boy did it, and then suddenly everything goes wrong, and his little brother makes a great run and goes too far and falls in the water. George doesn't even have to think about it. It's my brother. He jumps in that ice and water and helps his brother and his buddy help him and they save his brother's life. Harry. Well, that's the first act of grace that we see in the movie. The next thing that happens is he's he works for the drugstore and he delivers the druggist prescriptions to people out in the community. And this is a picture of that particular um, situation where he not only saves the lives of the people because he has just gotten word, the druggist has just gotten his his. Um, <coughs> Um, word that his son has been killed and he's all beside himself and he's in tears and he's so upset that he puts poison in capsules to send to this pe these people who have diphtheria. George goes to his father trying to get some advice. What do I do? This man, you know, or this is a, a man I'm supposed to be do what my boss tells me to do, but I can't do that. And so he winds up going back and he tells the druggist and the druggist slaps him around and uh, actually breaks his eardrum in the process. But George did the right thing. He decided that he, he did this thing that he did the thing that saved the lives of the people with diphtheria and he saved the reputation of the druggist. We see that come into play later when the druggist would have become a drunk if, Joe, if George Bailey had not ever been alive. <laughs> he says, I just wish I'd ever been born at the end of the movie. George's father and uncle start the business of the building and loan, and their building and loan was 
basically one purpose so that people wouldn't have to live in the poverty areas that Mr. Potter would not take care of, but he charged people undue amounts of rent. So they, there's a, there's a selfless act in itself, a really start, yeah, it's a business startup and whatever, it's a building and loan, but the purpose was uh, people thinking of other people. And then George has these big plans. He's going to go see the world. And then his father passes away. And he has to stay and save the building alone, which in turn saves the lives. And many people have better lives because of George Brady and what he's done. And then his brother decides to go to college, so he stays at the building and loan again. A selfless act. Then he gets married. They have saved $2,000, and they were going to go to Bermuda, and they were going to go and have all of the best things you would ever want on your honeymoon. But what happens? The people are making a run on the back bank, and... George and Mary don't even take a honeymoon because the $2,000 winds up giving money to the people who need it, who came to get the things they had at the savings and loan. So there's another selfless act. They gave up their honeymoon altogether and wound up having their honeymoon suite being the old house where they used to throw rocks and break the windows out of the old derelict house down at the end of the street. They stay at the building and loan and the opportunities they provide for people to have nice homes as opposed to live in those poverty areas. Mr. Potter, <laughs> I'm not going to say a whole lot about him. We know that he was the bad guy. But the bottom line is, you can go on do some other back lines. And there's George praying that prayer that started the whole movie. And he's asking God to intervene in the circumstance because Uncle Billy has lost $8,000 and he was going to wind up having to go to prison. And because uh, Potter had already sworn out a warrant for his arrest for embezzlement and so on and so forth. So they send Clarence, the angel, who decides to jump in the water, which that was a pretty selfless act. But he really wanted, he was both highly motivated because he wanted to earn those wings. After 200 years, he hadn't, he hadn't won his ring, wings yet. And so there he is interacting with George and trying to explain to George that he was not non-essential. And one of the things that Mike Rowe said in his article was about that was what stood out to him about George Bailey, especially at the end of the movie, because he felt like he was non-essential. He said, I wish I'd never been born. And of course, to use that to show George that he had accomplished many really good things. And then the last act of grace that happens in the movie, because we know that George comes to his senses and he says, whatever's going to happen, so he goes home and the whole town shows up, brings money, and saves him from shame and prison. Always bothered me, though, that Potter got away with stealing that $8,000. He was never, he was never, that's never brought forth in the movie. But no matter, the Lord stepped up to the plate and took care of business because the entire community, because of George's continuous selflessness throughout his whole life, there in those moments, it all came full circle. That's what going the second mile does. 
you know, we use the term, we hear it anyway, we may not use it all that often, but what goes around comes around. That movie is a perfect example of that. But we know that that's the way that God works. God brings into play many things and many facets. The thing that we need to be concerned about is remembering who we are because of Jesus Christ. Jesus has said in Luke chapter 21 or 22 as he and the disciples are sitting around the table having what's now we call it the Last Supper You'll take your elements to the Lord's Supper. You know, when we think of others, when we put others in front of our own desires, what we're doing is really following this scripture where Jesus says, remember me when you do this. And when we do something for others, we're remembering what Christ did for us. And that because of what Christ did for us, we can uh, everybody got their little thing figured out might as well be cooperative there's instructions on the bottom of it <laughs> okay Right, I got it. Now, see, mine's, mine's already coming apart. That's all right. I'm good. Um, it says, and he took bread. And he passed it around to everyone. And he said, this is my body. It was broken for you. As oft as you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. And it says, in like manner, he took the cup and passed it around as well. And he said, this is my blood that was shed for you. Whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, do this and remember what I have done for you. Then it says, they sang a hymn and went out as it was his custom to the Mount of Olives. Now, we're not going to make that trip. But we are going to sing a hymn together. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to sing. You feel free to join in with me. It, it should be on the screen. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Let's stand as we sing. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he
Christine, would you lead us in our closing prayer, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we can come into your house and worship, Lord. We just ask you to be with each and every one of us and um, guide us as we go into this new week, Lord. <clears throat> just be with those who need you in a special way. Just be ever near to them and guide us and direct us and forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.